I'm going to tell you guys briefly today about the Arctic DEM project, which is a three-year project that's just wrapping up um, uh, that we've been running on Blue Waters um, for the last uh, two and a half years. So the project goal is to produce a two-meter posting that is two-meter resolution, publicly available, and that's key, elevation model of the Arctic. Um, it was the motivation for this was the U.S. chairmanship of the Arctic Council uh, back in 2016-17. This is the the, pro the project was to use stereoscopic satellite imagery to that was licensed to the f um, federal government by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And when President Obama announces that you're going to make an elevation model of the Arctic, you better get it done. So this is the domain. The Arctic DEM domain, everything north of 60 degrees, essentially, along with some extra fun stuff thrown in. The reason we chose this is because everything south of 60 degrees and north of 60 degrees south was covered by other satellite missions that have got pretty darn good topography for temperate regions. But the polar regions were left out. So in order to get this done, we needed essentially three major components. Stereoscopic imagery of the entire Arctic, no small feat. A scalable terrain extraction algorithm had to be open, open source, the uh, off the shelf stuff that you would run from a commercial provider is not going to work at this scale. And then approximately a ridiculous amount of compute. Some post processing tools, but we won't get into that now. For those who are not um, Familiar, let me just quick go over what stereoscopic imagery is. Essentially, these telescopes, these satellites are telescopes pointing down. They go overhead in a polar orbit, take a shot of a particular area of the Earth, go another 45 seconds or so, point back to the area they just collected, and collect it again. So you end up with two images taken of the same place at essentially the same time from a slightly different perspective. Then the terrain extraction tools take the differences between these two images, find the point on each that represents the same place. So this end of this peninsula here and the end of this peninsula there, back out from the satellite sensor model, the exact uh, location on Earth for these two points, assuming that they were shot straight down. Um, and then you can back out the elevation for that given point. And essentially, the algorithm does this for every point on the image, or a set grid. Then you end up with what we call mass points, or essentially x, y, z points, all in a set grid or irregular grid. And the DM creation step takes those points, removes some outliers, perhaps some blunders, fills in some errors, and grids them in a raster that then can, can be used for topographic analysis. This looks a little bit like a, an image of a glacier, but it's actually a hillshade rendering of a topographic model. The DM extraction tools all essentially work in a very similar way. You have a source point on one image that you want to match to a target point on the other, and it's a computer vision problem. How do you find the point on the second image that is the same thing as the point on the first? Um, and what all these algorithms do is they choose the closest, the best guess, essentially, based on the satellite sensor model. And then they give a search window, which is the reasonable location where you, the algorithm should sh search in order to find this homologous point. As you can imagine, shrinking that search window, even by a little bit, can increase the efficiency of the algorithm itself. Plus, in polar regions, we have another issue where there's a lot of repeat features. So this is a snow and wind, or wind sculpted snowscape feature called Sestrugi. And you can see at this scale, if you had this kind of search window, finding the homologous point for this point on that image isn't going to happen, human or computer. But if you can narrow the search window, all of a sudden it's quite easy for a human or computer to decide that's the homologous point. All of these algorithms also work on a pyramidal approach. So they started at a very coarse resolution, find the homologous points at that coarse resolution, and then use those results to seed the search window size for the next resolution level down. 
In our case, we in the polar NSF community are lucky enough to have access to the digital globe constellation of satellites. These are downward pointing telescopes that take images up to uh, 30 centimeters per pixel in the panchromatic. We are using the Worldview uh, satellites for this particular project. When we first proposed the project in 2014, we didn't even have full coverage of the Arctic. So this represents the stereoscopic image collections in the Arctic, cloud cover 20% or better. So presumably mostly cloud free. We just hoped that we could get full coverage. And as of this year, in collaboration with our, uh, with our friends at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency who licensed this data for the federal government, we were able to task all the satellites to cover the Arctic for every single kilometer squared with a presumably cloud-free image. And some areas are actually covered multiple times, especially areas of high scientific interest like uh, outlet glaciers, um, areas of ecological uh, fragility, that sort of thing. So why blue waters? At first glance, our workflow doesn't seem like it needs the blue waters. These are single node jobs. Yes, there's an MPI version, but it's not nearly as efficient as the single node um, OpenMP version. However, we had three years to get this done. President Obama told us to. You can't say no to that guy. And just consider the source, or the, the amount of data that we had to get through. So 152 source strips, that's about 100 kilometers wide by 20, 100 kilometers long by, by 20 kilometers wide. Each of those, for memory and space reasons, is chopped up into smaller sub pieces, which means that each of those 150,000 source strips end up with nine and a half on average jobs that they uh, engender. So million and a half jobs, uh, 13 hours for each one on average, 18 million node hours. Sure, we could have done this on another machine, and we would still be waiting for the output to be done. Plus, the source imagery itself, which is at half meter per pixel resolution or better, is three quarters of a petabyte. And moving that to another machine, much less storing it and effectively accessing it, it's another reason why Blue Waters was the, really the only option from an academic supercomputing uh, perspective. Plus, and I want to give a huge shout out here to Greg and Galen and their whole group. The user support on Blue Waters has been extraordinary. We'd never run on a machine this big, and um, our single node uh, jobs were not the perfect fit, but they moved heaven and earth and even the torque scheduler to um, make it work for us. So why Blue Waters? On a good day, the uh, Earth Sciences section is three quarters, two thirds of the, the Blue Waters um, running nodes on the web page. Now, don't get mad at me. We're running the low queue. We're interruptible. If you guys wanted the machine at this point, you could have had it, okay? <laughs> but if this stays this way for two days, we are running essentially the equivalent of two meters pixel resolution topography for the entire lower 48 over the weekend. That's why Blue Waters. So let me present a few results from the Arctic Dem project. We finished up all of our processing just a couple weeks back. Many thanks to the production team for all their hard work. In total, we got 136,000 of these long strips complete. Um, we're also planning on building a seamless mosaic, or we're in the process of building a seamless mosaic with 100 by 100 kilometer tiles. And that'll end up being um, 2,500 or so of these two meter mosaic tiles. Overall, we ended up getting almost a half a petabyte of DM data um, through Blue Waters. And that, if you think of it as each of these individual time stamped strips, that's geographic coverage of 165 million square kilometers. The Arctic itself is only 20 million square kilometers. So that's more, on average, more than eight different looks at every square kilometer in the Arctic. Now, as you can see, some points still aren't perfectly covered. There are areas where we don't have enough coverage that's cloud-free, and we were not able to actually fill in those pixels. 
But that means that some places are covered up to 30 times with this data set that spans 10 years. When we were here last in May 2017, we had just done our, our fourth release and all the areas in salmon and coral were, uh, were finished. As of September that same year, we released the entire rest of the Arctic for a sort of a single coverage, our, our best, best shot at a full coverage. Since then, we have run the entire archive. So that is to say, every single stereoscopic image that was shot by Digital Globe that we could get our hands on, we ran through blue waters. So not only do we have synoptic coverage, we also have time-stamped um, strip DEMs of every place in the Arctic so you can see how it's changing. This is a look at the mosaics that we'll be building. Um, that we, we did build for previous releases and we'll be rebuilding for this coming release in a couple of months. So I want to show you guys just a couple of examples of what existed before Arctic Dem in a couple of places. These next three examples are from our collaborators in Iceland. Um, the pan-Icelandic DM they had was created from um, air photos and contour lines and digitized. So this is what they used to have. And that's what Arctic Dem looks like. So you can see the increase in detail that's going to help with transportation planning, with hydrologic modeling, even with geologic mapping. Some volcano that I can't pronounce. Again, the change in resolution represents a, a leap forward in terms of what you're able to do with the uh, detail and, and, and uh, of this data as a source into, as an input into other types of science. This is Reykjavik. Before you couldn't see much, now you can count the swimming pools. Do they have swimming pools in Iceland? I don't actually know. These next two examples are from our own beloved home state of Alaska actually from Minnesota, but I mean, you, you know what I mean. Um, this is the national elevation data set as it currently existed for that area. And this is the Arctic Dem. This is St. Lawrence Island off of Alaska. National elevation data set hadn't actually even gotten it all. And now with Arctic Dem, you can see all the detail. So I want to give you just a few examples of the applications of some things that people have used Arctic Dem for. Unlike perhaps most of the other projects on Blue Waters, we are a science support organization primarily. And while we're very proud of our few publications, the real goal of this project is to make the data, put it out there, and have other people use it. Right? Because elevation is, like, is a foundational data set. It's, it's the basis for hydrologic modeling. It's the basis for... Um, for, for siting moving towns, for urban planning, for transportation planning, for uh, glaciology, for everything. Anything that has a location needs an elevation. So first off, we'll talk about some work done by um, a friend, Greg Fisk, who works at Woods Hole Research Center. He is tracking um, methane craters in Siberian Russia, where not too many people go, first off. Um, and second of all, not too many Americans get to go. So you can see this timestamp, these are four different years. You have the initial uh, sort of uplift created by the methane bubble, the first eruption, further erosion of the, uh, of the area, and then a sort of a stable state re realized when the water has filled up the, uh, the hole. And if you look at it from a cross-section, the first year, you have the um, initial rise, then the initial eruption, third year, the further excavation, and lastly, the stable state where the water has refilled. And he can look at these in the Arctic DEM data set without ever having going there, um, and across the entire Arctic, not just in one study site. 
This next example is by uh, Mike Willis at University of Colorado Boulder, also a collaborator on the Arctic DM project. Um, he's looking at a glacier up in the uh, Svernaya Zemlya um, Russian archipelago. And this is a glacier called Vavilov. So in March 2013, this is a cold base glacier. It's not supposed to change quickly. In March 2013, you can see it's pretty stable. There's the next timestamp. And the next, starting to see a little bit of change here. Then from 15 to 16, the whole thing collapsed. So pre-2012, it was hardly changing. And that 2015 to 16 step is four and a half cubic kilometers of ice lost. Plus with the detail in this, these data sets, you can actually identify exactly where things are changing and by how much. Not just that you lost this much ice, like you could maybe get from the GRACE satellite, but exactly how and why in a detail. Last example I wanna share is um, from the a tsunami that occurred in Greenland a few, what, a year and a half back. Um, this is a little town called Nukatsiak, um, which means Little Peak. And there was a earthquake and landslide down the fjord from this location. Here's Nukatsiak right here. They're all, these towns are all marine-based economies, and so they're all right next to the shore. You can see the little black dots. This is the digital globe imagery, by the way. You can see the little black dots that uh, indicate the houses. This is right before the tsunami that came from the landslides and right after. And I'll go back and forth a few times. You can see the little black dots right along the shore, especially in here, are just gone. So what the Greenland survey did with this is um, they used the Arctic Dam data set and some radar measurements they had to identify the areas that changed in the landslide, essentially those things that sloughed off into the ocean, um, and then use the Arctic DEM model of this town to create a run-up map for any potential future tsunamis caused by this in, in, in unstable region nearby. Therefore, they can recite some of these uh, really vulnerable houses further up onto the landscape and mitigate the potential for future loss of life. Now, as proud as we are of our cute little piddly three um, publications, and we are proud of them, the real goal of this project is to get the data out and enable other people to use it. So what we've been remarkably been surprised and, and, and and very pleased by the way the community has embraced this data set. Even, it's not even done yet, for goodness sakes. Um, and so far there's been 17 publications using these data uh, in peer-reviewed literature. Quick shout out to the Arctic DEM team, some of whom are also here. We span uh, Polar Geospatial Center at the University of Minnesota and Ohio State University, who developed the, the SETSUM algorithm, the terrain extraction algorithm and then collaborators at University of Colorado Boulder, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, among other places. 